when the mind has trouble settling down with the breath. You want to check to see if the problem is with the mind or with the breath, or with your perceptions in the mind or the breath. The first problem, the mind. Sometimes you have lots of issues that are unresolved, and simply putting them aside and trying to focus on the breath is not enough. You have to think them through. And what this means is thinking about them in a way that's not your usual way of thinking about them, because the way, your usual way of thinking about them is what's causing the problem. And you can't just say, well, just stop thinking altogether and solve the problem. You have to first think in a way that's it's going to take some of the burdens off your heart. Then you can settle down. When I first went to stay with John Fu, I was meditating and found a lot of issues from my family life and childhood, college years, whatever, were coming up. And with some of them I could talk them over with him. Some of them he just thought so it was very strange. And I began to realize that I got that strange look in his eye when I tell him about one of my problems. I realized okay, this is a very American problem. I have to work it through myself. But I noticed that when he was dealing with problems that he was familiar with, that the, the solution always was a combination of understanding karma and understanding goodwill. The karma doesn't mean that people suffer because they deserve to suffer. That's not the right understanding of karma. The karma is basically people have lots of actions in their personal history, good, bad. It's like having a field filled with seeds. Some of the seeds are buried there for a long time, and they're not going to sprout for a long time. Others are ready to sprout. And what you see at any one time are the ones that are sprouting, and particularly the ones that you're watering with your own attention, your own interest in them, whether they're good or bad. So the fact that something bad is sprouting right now doesn't mean that everything in the field is bad, simply that that's what the current crop is. And how do you make sure that there are good seeds in there? Well, you plant them. That's the other aspect of karma, is you try to go back and straighten out everything in your past. Try to settle things as to who's right, who's wrong, where, where the blame can be assigned, or whatever. You start thinking back, 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 back through all those many lifetimes. There's no starting point. There's no way you could settle the scores. So you just have to say, well, that's part of the human condition, that we all have good and bad seeds in our background. And right now, though, you have the opportunity to plant some good seeds. And in planting the good seeds, it makes it a lot easier for the mind to withstand the effects of the past bad seeds. As the Buddha said, it's like throwing a lump of salt into some water. If you have just a little cup of water, then you can't drink the water because the lump of salt makes it too salty. But if you have a large river, the water in the river is clean. You throw the lump of salt in, and you can still drink the water. The large river there stands for a mind that is trained, specifically trained in the Brahma Viharas, goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity learning to extend these attitudes to all people, both for their benefit and for yours. For their benefit, sometimes simply thinking goodwill to other people, they'll feel it. Sometimes they won't feel it, but at least having developed that attitude within ourselves, we begin to realize that we're more trustworthy in our interactions with other people. And that immeasurable quality of the mind. In other words, you don't measure out your goodwill saying, well, I'm going to give this much to this person and this much to that person. I'm going to give everything you've got to everybody. And it comes back in a kind of safety. As the Buddha said, this is your wealth as a meditator. This is your protection. And it's your gift to the whole world. You can make it specific to specific people you know are suffering. But you want to be able to extend it to everybody. And taking that point of view of everybody, you start thinking about the chant that we repeat often, 
all living beings are the owners of their actions. That chant we also have, um, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. The Thai translation is, aging is normal, death is normal, illness is normal. And in the original sutta where that reflection is found, it goes on to say, it's not just me, it's everybody. You think about the whole world, the whole cosmos. Everybody lives in a state where aging, illness, and death are normal. And when you can think in these terms, it helps to relieve a lot of burdens. So that larger perspective makes it easier to finally settle in, <clears throat> settle in, get centered with the breath. There are other reflections though as well. Sometimes reflecting on the Buddha is helpful. I hear somebody who had everything in life, but he realized having everything in life is not enough. There's got to be something better than the normal stuff of what they call everything in life. He went out, sacrificed a lot of years of his life, underwent a lot of suffering, but finally came across something that really was more than everything. It was the deathless. He came back and he taught it for free. It's hard to find now. Just this evening we got a brochure from a publisher. Had at least 30 or 40 mindfulness books, all for sale. This is what people do nowadays. They learn a little bit about mindfulness and they find a way to make money off of it. The Buddha knew a lot more about mindfulness and he didn't charge at all. His teachings were free. Walked all over India for 45 years, teaching whoever could be taught. People of all kinds. So this is the person who found this path we're on. Sometimes thinking about that can be inspiring as well. Or you can reflect on the Sangha, the stories in the canon of the members of the Sangha, who, many of whom suffered an awful lot. And got very discouraged in their practice, but then were able to pick themselves up and finally gain awakening. That can be inspiring too. So there are various reflections you can engage in, and sometimes you can spend the whole hour, and it's not a wasted hour, learning how to rethink the issues in your mind from the Buddha's point of view. Because his way of thinking that he it recommends for all of us are ways of thinking that help take the sting out of our suffering. It's all part of right view and right resolve. This is all part of the path. So learning how to rethink your issues is an important skill in the meditation. You look at the values if you picked up from society and you realize that there are a lot of them in there that are not designed to help relieve suffering. They actually pour more suffering on. And so it's in your own best interest to learn how to rethink things, recast the narrative, till the mind is ready to settle down. Then you look at the breath. Sometimes the problem is with the breath. It's not comfortable. There may be pains in the body. Learn how to breathe through the pains. Think of the breath not as just the air coming in and out of the lungs, but also the flow of energy in the body. If you can't feel the flow, just ask yourself, where is it tense or tight in the body? And relax those spots. Make a comparison. Say, you think there's some tension in your right shoulder? Well, compare it with your left shoulder. If the left shoulder seems more relaxed, see if you can create that same sensation in the right shoulder. Go down through the body this way. But many times an issue that seems to be an issue of the breath is actually an issue of your perception of the breath or your perception of the mind in relationship to the breath. I know I had a problem when I was first meditating, and John Fung would say, watch out for your mind so that you, if you see that's going to slip off into a distraction. You. Work more with the breath. Well, I couldn't believe that you could see yourself slip off into a distraction. You were either not distracted or you were distracted. So I asked him, how can you tell your, see if the mind's going to slip off? He said, there are warning signals. 
And as I watched, I found, sure enough, that was the case. The mud is kind of like an inchworm. It comes to the edge of a leaf, and part of it's still on the leaf, but another part of it's waving around, looking for the next leaf. And the next leaf comes, and boom, it's off. Well, it's the same with the mind. Part of it may be with the breath, but part of it starts looking around. And if you're really alert, you begin to see, oh, these are the warning signals. This is the mind about to slip off. And when it's about to slip off, a lot of the problem is that the breath is no longer interesting at that point. So you turn around and say, well, what's going on in the breath I can still work with? Learn how to take more of an interest in the breath. See, if there are any pains in the body, can you use the breath to work around those, work through them, kind of dissolve the tension around them? If there's some stiffness, whatever, and see if the breath can help. It gives you something to get interested in. We're going to ask ourselves, where in the body is the greatest sensitivity to the breath? Well, for it's the area around the heart. Does it feel, feel really good when you breathe in, right down in that area? Or does it just feel kind of blasé? If it feels blasé, ask yourself, what would be really satisfying there? What would feel really, really good there? And see how the body responds. Sometimes it will involve thinking of the breath coming in from another direction. Then it normally comes. And in releasing the tension that may be there around the heart, you may feel that other patterns of tension in the body show up as well and begin to get released too. So there's a lot to explore here. If you're bored with the breath, it means you're not looking. There's also that perception of the mind that can get in the way, the idea that the mind is only at one spot. Actually, you have an awareness that fills the body already. It's kind of a background awareness, and then there's one spot where you're focused. And what you're trying to do as you work with the concentration and get to develop a whole body awareness is to try to connect that sense of being focused, but also be in touch with the background so that you begin to see it's all part of the same thing, all part of the same awareness. So even though there may be one spot which is more prominent than the others in the awareness, it's connected with the background awareness, too. One way to build up to this is to think of two spots at once, kind of a line connecting the two. And so you're aware of the whole line, and then from the whole line you can give more of a three-dimensional quality to that line so it begins to fill out the rest of the body. So that your focused awareness and your background awareness all become one. And so when the mind fills the body like this, that it doesn't have any extra hands to grab onto anything else. If the mind is only in one spot, it's like holding on to a post with one hand and then spinning around and trying to grab whatever comes by with your other hand. And there's lots you can grab that way. In other words, you can be with the breath, you can be with Bhutto, but other parts of the mind are grabbing onto this, grabbing onto that. But if you're aware of the whole body and you're trying to make your attention three-dimensional like this, then there are no extra hands to grab onto anything. Everything is full. Your sense of your hands is in your hands, your sense of your head is in your head. The awareness in the body, it's like your awareness has a shape like the body, and all the parts are together. All the parts line up. And when you think in these ways, you find that you actually get the mind into concentration. Because when we talk about keeping the mind with concentration, what are you doing? It's just not like you're holding it by the scruff of the neck or putting a chain on it. It's the way you think about things that keeps you concentrated. And you want to learn how to think about things connecting with this full body awareness. So the thinking and the awareness are in tune. 
And then it's simply a matter of reminding yourself, stay here, stay here. When you're not staying here, then you remind yourself, move back, do this, do that. There's going to be a lot of direction going on in the background. But as things begin to settle down, that directing voice can get simpler. The directions get simpler. And your thinking actually becomes part of the concentration. So the way you think coming into the meditation is an important part of the practice. You can't just say, well, I'll drop all my thinking and just be right here. You've got to think your way through whatever problems are getting in the way. And as I said earlier, don't regard it as a waste of time. Because it takes thinking to solve thinking. Now, there's some issues you find that you can put them aside for the time being. You realize that you can't cut all the way through them, but you've been able to disable them enough so they're not going to get in the way. This is a long-term process we're working on. Because the mind has lots of unskillful ways of thinking, lots of unskillful ways of understanding itself. And learning how to get the mind into concentration gives you a long-term source of sustenance to keep you going as you begin to take these problems apart.